Hello, everyone. Hello. We have decent amplification? A little bit more would be good. Okay. In that case, I will do it from the gut instead of from the mic. Um, I would like to welcome everybody to this event. You are here for local war, and if you thought you were here for something else, well, um, welcome to local war. <laughs> And I'd really like to start out by thanking the Festival of the Book for hosting this event and for choosing these books. Um, today we'll be speaking with Jack Landers and Pam Bellwing, Eating Aliens and, well, Eating Aliens in particular, um, for Jack and Sustainable Market Farming for Pam are their offerings for today. Um, as you may have heard in other venues, this is the 19th year of the Festival of the Book and we are very pleased to be a part of this spectacular event. Um, I think that uh, we also should recognize our sponsor. The sponsor for this one is Earth Week, and if anybody is interested in what's happening at next year's, uh, next month's festival, you can talk to the lady in the back, Jessica Glendening, president of Earth Week. Thank you very much for sponsoring. Um, both organizations, uh, Festival for the Book and Earth Week, are nonprofits. So if you would like to make a donation to one or both, or <laughs> I'm sure that the people at the back would like to help you out with that. Now, um, I would like to introduce our authors. Pam Dowling will start off our conversation. She's had 20 years of managing really just vegetables on three and a half acres at Twin Oaks. Twin Oaks is an intentional community in Louisa, and her three and a half acres feeds all 100 members plus some. It's amazing what you can do with just a little bit of land. Not that you don't have more acreage than that to play with. Uh, she also writes for Growing from Market, a trade publication on food production. For the other side, the, uh, we build this at Earth Week as an omnivorous event. <laughs> we have Jack Landers. And many of you have seen his articles in Huffington Post, Waypo, New York Times, Slate, and other publications. He also has a very popular blog, The Look of War Hunter, and his book, Eating Aliens, came out um, with a bit of a splash. You got quite a bit of coverage on that one. Um, thank you both for being here, and I'm going to turn this over to Pam. Okay, uh, wave at me if you can't hear clearly, okay? Um, so, um, you can probably tell from my accent that I wasn't raised around here, but I've been living here uh, since 1991 and uh, growing a lot of vegetables. And uh, uh, as time went on, while I was um, working in the gardens at Twin Oaks, uh, it became important to me to make really good use of the space we had. And so I started keeping records uh, of what worked and how we went and how we planted things. And after a while of that, I started using that information to um, write magazine articles for Growing for Market. And there's some free copies at the back that the publishers sent. Um, you can also get free bookmarks, so you don't necessarily have to buy a book. Well, that'd be nice. Um, uh, I, I first got serious about uh, writing a book in June of 2009. Uh, it happened that Twin Oaks was looking for some more new ways to uh, earn income because our hammock sales had gone down. And I thought, uh, in blissful ignorance, I thought, oh, we can publish a book uh, next year. And I had no idea of the work involved. So um, I quickly realized, though, that fronting a lot of money to pay the printers and doing a lot of marketing are two things that Twin Oaks is not the greatest at. So I started looking around for a publisher. And I approached one publisher, who's not a new society who actually published my book, but a different one. They said they were really excited about the book. And then the following June, they decided that they didn't quite have enough confidence in me. Easy. Um, so they dumped me. And I won't tell you who they were. Uh, but then I got in a bit of a funk. But it was summer, and I was really busy in the garden. So I didn't do anything about getting the book published for a few months. Um, and then in the fall, I kind of thought, well, I need to pay more attention. You know, it's time to send the book out, not just to one publisher, but to several. So um, I read up about writing book proposals um, with books from the library, yay for libraries. And um, 
and I sent my proposal off to about six or seven different publishers. And uh, in, in the next February, I heard back from New Society. They said they were very interested, and uh, uh, in, in August, we signed a contract, and um, my, the date for sending in my manuscript was, like the, I actually sent it in a year ago, yesterday. Um, it took me a long time to finish writing it. At the time I thought of writing it, I had, I think, perhaps about half the book written as in form of articles that I'd written for Grow for Market magazine. It's Grow for Market magazine. Uh, but I still needed to write uh, at least uh, another 19 chapters, uh, maybe more. And also I was trying to, like, I was needing to update the older articles and make them fit together and not duplicate each other, you know, with the same stuff. So there I was, you know, I was running, I was working full time uh, growing vegetables, but I managed to find, during the summer, I managed to find 10 hours a week by, um, uh, we share uh, offices at Twin Oaks and we have a lot of different um, desktop computers. I would sign one out for two hours on five days a week from two to four. And so after lunch, I would, uh, I would go to the garden, I would set the irrigation up and pick up loose ends from the morning shift and then grab a cup of tea and dash into the office and write for two hours. And then I would leap up and go out and transplant lettuces or cabbages or something. Um, I was very focused. Uh, <laughs> I managed to get, get it done and I sent it in, uh, yeah, as I say, a year ago. And um, everything was going fine for a while. And uh, we got all the way through uh, copy editing during the early summer. And then the storm burst. Um, I, I knew I'd written a bit too much, rather a lot too much, actually. And, uh, but no one had said anything. You know, I'd asked the publisher to give me some guidance about what, how much was too much, or how much more was too much, you know. And uh, I didn't really get a clear answer. So I thought, oh, well, I'll send it in and they'll soon tell me. And so I sent it in and nothing had happened. So I thought, okay. We did the copy editing, every little comma and so on. And still nothing. And I thought, oh, well, I guess it's okay. Then they're just gonna do a bigger book. And uh, then, um, we got to August and uh, they were flowing the text into their, the, the typesetting people, except it's all digital these days, they were flowing the text into their program and suddenly they realized it was too long. So that was a hard week. I had to actually lock out for about four chapters and shorten some others. Um, and it's still, you can see, it's still a, it's still a pretty big book. <laughs> so I had lots to say. <laughs> Uh, and so um, that was how I came to write the book. Um, so initially, the, the sort of the motivating force was the idea of earning some more money for the community to replace some of the money we weren't earning selling hammocks. Um, but also, I was motivated because as I'd been reading books about vegetable production, um, I'd noticed. Uh, several sort of glaring gaps in what was available, uh, what books were available out there. Um, one thing I've noticed is that a lot of gardening books, a lot of books about growing vegetables are written for home gardeners and they're not written for commercial growers. And so they, um, they assume you have all the time in the world to do these things and they don't necessarily focus on efficient techniques or um, uh, varieties that produce well and are disease resistant, which are important if you're earning a living or you're providing for a hundred people, which is kind of comes to the same thing, really. So that was that was one big obvious gap to me was that we needed more uh, books about organic vegetable production um, that were scaled up and paid attention to efficiency. Um, another thing that I noticed was that a lot of books were aimed at um, people starting up, buying land and starting growing vegetables for the first time. So a lot of the book would be taken up with how to find suitable land. And these books were mostly kind of written in the 90s. A lot of people bought land and started up and they didn't need another of those kind of books. But a lot of people needed a book that told you more practical details of how to 
produce crops more effectively and better quality. Um, and we didn't need to hear any more about buying land. So that was the second kind of gap that I noticed. Um, also, um, really, a lot of a lot of vegetable growing books were written in the 90s. There was a big bunch of them then, big big spur of gardening books. Um, and some things, you know, carrots grow much the same as they did in the 90s. But <laughs> there are some things that have changed. You know, there's there's new products and new techniques. There's um, you know, there's stuff like um, hoop houses have really come into their own. Um, uh, biodegradable plastic mulch, drip irrigation, stuff like that it wasn't really much used in the 90s. Um, also techniques like farmscaping, which is where you grow some flowers in amongst your vegetables to attract beneficial insects. Um, that's, I mean it's an old idea, but it's sort of come around again as, as something to pay attention to. Um, the use of computers for record keeping and research and so on, I mean, in the 90s, we were scarcely getting going on that, really. So, I think some things have changed. <laughs> so, I thought there's another, another gap. Um, uh, let me see what I did write some notes. Um, the, the other big one, really, was that I noticed that, you might have noticed this too if you read gardening books, they're mostly written in Vermont, and Maine and, uh, and Oregon and um, it's not like that here and I used to think oh you know it's because those people they have such long winters they have all the time to write books and we don't have time here we're gardening year round but somehow I decided to make time and so um, I think that the southeast has been really underserved with with books. I mean, we have Tanya Dekla here in Charlottesville, so um, we do, we're not we totally neglected. But uh, I felt that we could really use some some more books from the southeast. So my book is written kind of with a southeast flavour, but I've made sure to make it applicable to people in different um, climate zones um, by referring to temperatures and days before frost or after frost, um, stuff like that. And, uh, and also, because of my experience growing vegetables in England, I have some direct experience of um, definitely milder summers and milder winters too. So I, I'm not I'm only familiar with the kind of Virginia climate. Um, so, so those are some of the sort of big gaps that I had noticed um, and that I wanted to fill with my book. Uh, so then I thought about, you know, who is it intended for? And obviously any kind of farmer growing small scale, sustainable vegetables. Um, uh, also, of course, homesteaders. Um, anybody who has been gardening like, on a small scale that wants to move into commercial growing or move into a homesteading kind of thing where you're growing a lot of the food for your own household. Um, any of those people. Also, um, urban farms, uh, city gardens, community gardens, uh, schools with food growing gardens. Um, um, also, um, interns and apprentices on sustainable farms. You know, people will go and they'll work for a season at one farm, but they want to know more than what one, what one farmer can teach in one season. I mean, as you may have noticed with many things in, in growing vegetables, you get like one chance a year to learn something. And then the time has passed and you have to remember it till next year. So, uh, that, was a, that was another bit of it. Um, uh, also, there are more and more courses in sustainable agriculture now, and I thought the students of those courses could uh, use my book. Um, and not just uh, not just people that grow vegetables, but also people who are closely involved with the local food supply, like food hubs and uh, people that are working on food safety issues, food security, any of that sort of thing. People that want to understand food production a bit better. So those were some of the sorts of people that I, I thought of uh, when I was writing my book. Um, I'm sure there are many more. <laughs> um, 
So here it is, and as, as I said, it's a big book. It's, uh, it's basically in two sections, the how-to in the first half and the, the what in the second half. Um, also at the end, there's a chapter by Ira Wallace from Southern Exposure Seed Exchange in Mineral. She writes about growing seed crops for, for cash. Uh, and there's a big resource listing which I made and there's a concise index that's by Twin Oaks indexing business. It's another business of Twin Oaks. Uh, so in the how-to section, I cover the planning and organization. Um, also techniques for being able to sow and um, transplant successfully, including things like um, getting good seed germination in hot weather, uh, things like that that you won't find in those books from Vermont. Um, uh, also uh, season extension because people do want to eat all year round and there's more demand these days for local food all year round. So I've covered all the various methods of season extension. Uh, I've also written about caring for our soil and uh, sustainable management of the big three plagues, the pests, the diseases, um, and the weeds. So I've written about all that. Um, also cover crops, and I have some amazingly magnificent charts in the book. Um, uh, I've written about uh, harvesting and storage of winter crops. I've written about uh, winter hardy vegetables that you can grow and storage that's mostly not relying on electricity. <coughs> so I don't just say harvest it and put it in your walk-in cooler. There are other options for a lot of, a lot of vegetables. Time running out? Yes. Yes. Uh, and in the second half of the book, uh, I cover the different kinds of vegetables, many, many different kinds. We have tried everything that we can grow in this climate, and we've tried a few things that we failed to grow in this climate as well. So um, all those crops are covered in, in quite a lot of detail. And, uh, so it adds up to a book that I hope will be of real great use to lots of people, people that are going to grow food, people that hope that other people are going to grow it for them. Um, so I'm passing on information. I was given a lot of help in writing this book from other, lots of information from other farmers and growers, and I want to pass that on so that more and more people learn how to grow good food so we can eat good food. <laughs> I believe that hunting is a critical component of the local food movement. And I think it's something that's been missing for a long time, and it's, it's, uh, it's past time for people to start doing something about that. I believe that hunting for food fits the values that inform not only the local food movement, but I think that it can also fit the values that inform um, a lot of vegetarians and even vegans. I believe that hunting for food can fit with the values of even, you know, if you're a PETA member, I think there's a way to do this so that it fits with your values. From an environmental perspective, let's look at carbon footprint. Okay, if I go to the grocery store and I buy a steak, you know, what's, where, does that, where does that meat come from? Well, you've got to go way back because, you know, you've got the cow, you've got the grain that fed the cow, you've got the fertilizer that was used to make, uh, to, to produce the, uh, the, the grain. Okay, so you've got oil from the other side of the world that's shipped all the way across the planet and it's processed into fertilizer and there's some nasty environmental things happening along the way there. And then you're going to take that fertilizer, you're going to ship it out to the Midwest and you're going to use that to produce um, a whole lot of uh, subsidized grain. And then you're going to put that in you know, box cars and you're going to take that to feed lots where it's going to be used. To, um, to to fatten the, uh, the the cattle up, and then you're gonna, and then that's going, to, then those are are taken to a slaughterhouse, and then the meat is brought here. You've got, you know, tens of thousands of miles that have to be traversed, and, and it's a miracle of the modern economy. I don't want to, you know, I'm not against having food move around. Um, uh, there, there are some some things that kind of have to move around like that. So I mean, local food is not a religion, but it's a, it's a good thing, I think. 
The point is, so this is a pretty big carbon footprint, and this is a whole lot of, of, um, of effort to, to put a T-bone steak in, in front of me at the grocery store. And I mean, much of that is the same story behind, you know, if you want a, a tofu burger, you know, you've got soy that's moving around, you've got, you've got the same story with the fertilizer and the oil from the other side of the world. Well, most of the year, as much of the year as I can, uh, I eat uh, wild venison, and most of the deer that I have uh, uh, butchered and eaten came literally from my own, my own backyard. Um, many is a deer I have gotten um, just by you know, co coming home a little bit early, walk out back to where an ambush that I had set up where I knew the deer is, and I'm out there for 15 minutes or so because they're deer that I have patterned and I know their behavior, and I shoot the deer right there, I butcher it there, I drag the quarters of meat into my kitchen and cut them up and put them in the fridge and the freezer. Food miles, Zero. Zero. How much petroleum did it take to produce that? Nothing. And if I do it with a bow, I can use that same arrow again and again and again. I think this is probably more sustainable and this is more uh, environmentally friendly, uh, a way to eat in terms of you know, providing a protein than what you find environmentally behind most vegetarian diets. And I, have, I, I don't mean any, I'm not knocking vegetarians. I grew up in a vegetarian household. I made vegetarian friends, and I respect the, the values that inform that. And, and, and I'm here to say that I share those values. I'm not in, in uh, conflict with them as a hunter. Let's look at land use. Uh, they're not, was it Roy Rogers said, they're not making any more of the stuff. So we've got a whole bunch of land that's put into food production, whether it's uh, uh, vegetables or corn or what have you. Now what else is that, if you've got a cornfield, what else is that land doing? I guess it's producing a little bit of oxygen. Those are plants, that's good. It's better than just having it paved over. Not very good habitat for wildlife, really. In fact, we usually go to a lot of effort to deny that land as habitat to wildlife. You've got farmers that are constantly trying to keep wildlife out. Uh, it's not usually used for recreation or anything like else. It's usually land used to produce food is just doing that. Well, when I shoot a deer, that that food is being that meat is being produced on land that's doing other things. It's running around in the woods. You've got uh, state parks and and um, and forests, national forests that are producing venison. Okay, so that's land that's is pro providing recreation opportunities for people. It's providing habitat for lots of other animals, and then it's also producing a certain amount of food, which I food which I would ballpark to. Um, I, I did the math on this once, and it came out to I think something like. Um, uh, 15 or 20 pounds of meat per acre for this type of habitat uh, per year, roughly, of, of venison that's, that's usually being produced. Uh, let's look at uh, land and tra transportation infrastructure. You ever seen deer grazing on a meeting strip or, or out, you know, uh, at the at the airport, the Earliesville Airport? You know, you've got these broad, you know, stretches of lawn. That's part of transportation infrastructure. Well, the deer come out and graze on that. So now you're producing meat with that also. You can take, you know, if you've got your backyard, that's land that's in residential and recreational use that's also producing, uh, that's also producing food. Uh, I, don't, I can't really think of many other, you know, uh, things in land use that are doing that. I think it would be really cool if we had more of an effort to use some of these other pieces of land to, to cultivate food. You know, maybe that would be a good gardening book, you know, a medium strip gardening, right? Uh, <laughs> and the other advantage is that, you know, I, I used to be a gardener. Um, a long time ago. I was professionally, actually. I, uh, I spent a, a year or so in college working uh, for the Virginia Historical Society as a historic landscape gardener. And I do enjoy gardening. I don't have as much time to, to do it now. But what I really like is, is eating the gardens of, of people like Pam indirectly when they're the deer <laughs> devour her, her, her vegetables. And they come over to my land and, I, and I'm eating the vegetables indirectly. It's a lot easier than gardening. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm not guarding it. <laughs> Uh, and I think that um, if we look at, um, even if we look at just the fact of, okay, of killing something, it's sad that something has to, and every death is sad. Um, but I think almost any diet you could, I won't say it's impossible, it is possible to have a diet like a Jane Monk where if you just ate, you know, fruits, it is possible to eat, uh, to eat uh, uh, in a way where nothing dies, but it's very difficult and you can't feed a whole lot of people do. I mean, you can have a few individuals, but it's not, it's not any way that we're going to be able to run the world in it. Uh, let, I would encourage you to look at, rather, rather than is something meat or vegetable, in terms of ethics, let's look at the blood footprint. And by blood footprint, I mean, what is this total amount of suffering that it took to produce this food? Um, let's look, compare a venison burger that I'm going to make in my own kitchen with a soy burger. Okay, 
the um, with to, to make a soy burger. I know I, when I was working on this on my first book, uh, The Beginner's Guide to Hundred Years of Food. I did when I was doing a lot of research for that book. I, I read a whole lot of back issues of Corn and Soy Digest and read a lot of articles directed at people growing corn and soy. And they are at war constantly with with wildlife, and they're killing it all the time. Um, you know, you don't have a lot of, you, you, there are usually good sources of local vegetables, but you're not going to find usually your friendly neighborhood soy grower. I mean, this is a commodity crop produced on a very large scale. And in a lot of states, actually, they, um, they, they issue depredation permits to shoot uh, deer and other animal, animals, other wildlife that are eating the corn and soy. And actually, in some states, you're not legally allowed to use it for food. They don't want to create an incentive to abuse the permit. So they're shooting deer year-round and just leaving them to rot. So you've got that, you've got crows, you've got starlings and blackbirds are killed by the tens of thousands, often poisoned, to protect these soy and corn crops. And then, uh, what, and then what happens when you get it harvested? You know, nobody's pl plucking these one by one. If you've ever seen what it looks like when a combine goes across a, you know, a soy or corn field, it's this massive machine with giant spinning blades. Imagine what it would be like to be in that field, you know, you're this low, the corn is over your head, you hear a noise, there's some kind of big machine that's coming, you don't know which way to run because the corn is too high and all of a sudden it just comes right at you. Well, there's, you know, you, those, those fields are full of, you've got rabbits, you've got voles, you've got snakes, you've got all kinds, everything that's running around out there is getting shredded. You, if you walk behind one of those combines in one of those fields, you will find dead animals uh, all over the place. So now you've got your, you've got your soy and you, you're, you're taking it into a silo. You look at grain storage. Now they're fighting mice and rats. And they're trapping those by the thousands and thousands and thousands. And then they ship it to be processed into tofu. And it is, um, you know, used to cook the vegetarian meals. You know, the food that, the, that the tofu, that staple of, of vegans who want to avoid, you know, suffering for food. What's the blood footprint of that tofu burger? I don't know, but it's a lot. It's a lot of death to make a vegetarian meal sometimes. Let's compare that to my, uh, my venison burger. What's the blood footprint of that? One, one, I'm pretty comfortable with it. And I don't have to wonder, you know, how did this animal suffer? Was this something that, you know, uh, uh, died slowly? Or was it, was it abused in a factory farm? You know, was it poisoned? I know what happened, because I did it. You know, I know that I put that bullet in that deer, and I saw what, I took responsibility for what happened. I know that it died very quickly, you know, sometimes instantly. Usually, you know, when I pull the trigger on a deer, it's going to be, you know, unconscious either, you know, instantly or within 30 seconds, depending on what kind of shot that I made. And I'm pretty comfortable with that. So, I guess it, it may seem sort of counterintuitive to say that hunting for food is, um, it fits vegan values, but yeah, as a hunting instructor and teacher, you know, I'm, a, uh, I'm an instructor specialized in adult, adult beginners. Uh, I have had quite a few vegan students, and some of them maintain their vegan identity. Um, you know, they, they just sort of see it as a totally different uh, category if they are, you know, killing it themselves. Um, more recently, my work has verged into uh, invasive species. I am, you know, a very passionate advocate for uh, more aggressive removal of invasive species. And when I look at um, the, the things that are causing extinctions, and that's my rock bottom value as an environmentalist, as a conservationist, is uh, when we're you know, looking at competing interests for in any kind of um, uh, wildlife policy, I want to prevent extinctions. We have this incredibly uh, rapid rate of extinction going on that's unlike anything that's happened in millions of years. I mean, the rate of extinction going on. And um, there tend to be three um, factors that are influencing this. And one is a global warming. Whether you think it's man-made or not, I'm not gonna, you know, you don't even have to agree with me about that, but we've got all of these, um, these thermometers that again and again seem to show record highs for month temperatures month after month. I don't think all these thermometers are lying. Uh, that's causing extinctions. The second thing is loss of habitat. Uh, and in both of those, those issues, I see a lot of groups and individuals doing a lot of really good work on. There are a lot of people who are doing things about global warming and pollution. There are a lot of groups like the Nature Conservancy that are doing great things about habitat loss. The third thing, third factor, is invasive species. I looked around, I didn't really see a whole lot of people or groups doing a whole lot about it. I mean, there was a lot of study, but I didn't really see a whole lot of people doing something about invasive species. And I thought, well, I know how to hunt. I'm really good at killing stuff. Maybe there's something positive I could do with killing stuff. And I was really, I figured I was a good hunter, I knew how to teach, I knew how to write books, and so I thought I would put these things together, and I started working on my second book, uh, Eating Aliens. And I spent about 16 months traveling all around the U.S. and the Caribbean hunting and fishing for 
invasive species and, uh, and eating them. In some cases, I found that you know, things were actually practical, like silver carp. You really could have a commercial fishery for that. I think an aggressive, um, uh, an aggressive policy on that, you could, have, uh, you could have that problem solved within a decade, I think. And then other things turned out to be more, more difficult or were going to be palatable enough to enough people that you know, it was a fun story to tell about going after it. Not everything I think is going to be, we can't eat our way out of every environmental problem. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I can tell you this though, um, everything tastes like chicken, beef, or pork. Um, uh, texture, texture varies a lot more. Um, but I, it's another, um, when you're talking about either you know, diverting your, um, more of your diet, um, you know, your protein towards you know, local food in the form of you know, deer, wild turkey, and things like that, or in, in terms of eating and, and hunting invasive species, these are two things that um, I would offer a call to arms. I, we need more people, we need uh, more locavores to say, I'm going to learn how to do this as an adult beginner. I didn't grow up in a household where I was hunting. You know, I didn't grow up learning to, you know, to, to shoot. Uh, I started hunting in my mid-20s uh, as an adult beginner, and you can do it. I mean, this was, it's a lot easier now than it was 10 years ago. 10 years ago, there were no resources. You know, before I wrote this book, there, were, there was no book out there. There's nothing for an adult beginner because the assumption was either you grew up you know, with an older relative that was teaching you not to, to, to hunt or you would have had no interest in it at all. And, um, and so now there actually are resources. But you can, you can actually do this. I've had students, you know, my oldest a student was, I think, around 78 years old, and he became a successful hunter. I've had Jewish grandmothers. I've had vegans. I have had uh, chefs, people from all different uh, backgrounds and ethnicities. Anyone can be a, a successful hunter. And, and whether you want to, you know, uh, feed your family uh, or you, you want to uh, 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 cut down on predation in your garden because you've got the deer going after it, if you want to reduce your carbon footprint, or if you want to help uh, protect end uh, endangered species in some cases by hunting an invasive species, there are so many good reasons that are consistent with values that I think we all share. There's so many good reasons for, for us as adults um, to, to learn about, uh, about hunting. And so that's basically um, uh, where my career has, has taken me up, in, up to this point. Obviously, I'm very uh, passionate about this, and um, I'm looking forward to everyone's questions. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, Jack. I would like to open this up for questions. I have uh, one for each of you to start off. And it basically, I'm kind of flipping tables. Um, on you. Pam, since we've just had this wonderful um, advocacy piece on um, eating invasive species, in your gardening experience, have you ever come across edible plant species uh, that are invasive that you think that we could add to that list and taking that, um, taking that value into the garden or clearing out the garden? Um, and for Jack, going the other way around, in a way, um, invasives over the next 20 to 50 years since you brought up climate change, um, I know that Pan's book goes in, into quite a bit about growth zones and the changing climates, etc., um, at least in the first couple chapters, um, talking about how that is developing over time. Uh, what do you expect that to do to the plant, to the animal species? Then, after you've done answering those questions, we'll pass it out to the audience. Okay. Um, the, the big one that comes to my mind in terms of invasive plants is bamboo. That's edible. You can eat bamboo shoots, but my goodness me, it really is invasive. It's, it's scary. I certainly wouldn't recommend anybody to ever plant bamboo. Uh, we've got it growing at Twin Oaks. Uh, it was a sort of landscaping plant. Uh, it's a terror, it really is. Uh, so, that's the big one. Um, there are probably others, I don't know. Um, I mean, Katsu. really, katsu, yeah, yeah. We haven't got it's delicious, that. I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, a lot, of the, a lot of the weeds we have that we eat, yeah. they, they are alien. They came from Europe. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that, not my fault. Um, <laughs> but all the, I think those, all the winter annuals, like chickweed and so on, I think they are aliens. They're not native. Uh, you can eat them. 
Uh, I, have, I actually did a cooking with kudzu thing with NPR a few years ago. It was really good. The key is take the leaves and um, parboil them because they have this fuzzy stuff on them. Just parboil them very quickly. It's very flexible. We did a uh, kudzu pesto, uh, substituting for the basil. Uh, we did uh, kudzu dolmas, just using them like, uh, you know, like, like grape, uh, grape leaves. And then if you just want to use them as greens in a salad or something, um, they work very well, just parboil them. And spring is the best time when you have the younger, the smaller shoots that are... You, you don't want to... Um, the, the, the bigger leaves, you would use differently from the small ones. Uh, but to answer um, Tatiana's question for me about, okay, what, where are we going with invasive... What's, what's, what's going to be going on in the next 20 years or 50 years with invasive species? Uh, I'll look at North America. Um, I guess the bigger issue for spread of invasive species is um, probably less so global warming than global trade. So I'd say look at, look at changes in global trade. Uh, China has been investing so heavily in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Africa um, that I think we're going to see a lot more um, uh, container ships taking um, uh, products of various kinds uh, in and out of Africa. Uh, so I think that that's, that's where we're going to see more invasive species coming from. I think most of what we've had, been having trouble with for the last you know, 100 years or so in the U.S. has been uh, Asian species because we've had so much trade, we've had so much contact sustained between uh, North America and, and Asia and, and, and before that with Europe. So we had a whole wave of invasive species you know, prior to 1900 or so. They tended to come more from, from Europe. But Africa, we're going to have invasive species that aren't even on our radar yet that are going to hitch a ride in, in container ships. You know, once we have regularly, you know, uh, regular shipments of, uh, of bulk goods coming from African ports, you know, into New Orleans and Miami and places like that, Galveston, you are going to see all kinds of weird African invaders that, you know, we can, plants, insects, animals, you know, anything that can make that, that um, trip across the ocean. Uh, it's weird stuff that we're not even thinking about right now. Questions from the audience? Um, Jack. Yes. Herbivores tend to be more edible. Uh, animals, and I don't think of any many carnivores that are invasive other than coyote. Have you eaten a coyote? I have not eaten coyote. Uh, you know, I I thought very briefly about including coyotes in in eating aliens because they um, are invasive in the east in the eastern states. Uh, and it was human activity that allowed them to come here. Is, is uh, long story short, it was we extirpated the wolves, which were like a wall that kept the coyotes from coming over here because they competed with one another. Uh, and um, that's why they're here, it's human activity. But, you know, I like dogs. They look like dogs, they are canids, <laughs> they're closer. I don't want to shoot one, you know. I, I, if I had one going after one of my dogs, if it was in my front yard and I have small children, okay, would I shoot it then? Yes. Um, but I just, I just, I don't want to cut it up and eat it. Um, so I have not eaten a coyote. Uh, that said, there are, I mean, I'm not sure that that's necessarily true, this idea that herbivores taste better than carnivores. I've heard that said, but um, I don't know. It's particularly among fish. You know, I, there are plenty of uh, highly carnivorous fish that taste very good, and then there are plenty of you know, herbivorous fish that they taste. I mean, largemouth bass, I think, is, is delicious. And, um, I th uh, of course, trout is good, and those are uh, carnivores. And then, um, um, you know, the, 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 or, or uh, herbivorous fish, like a, you know, a red horse sucker or something, those taste fine also. I'm trying to think of, uh, I have eaten, uh, ra well, raccoons, of course, are uh, omnivores. Uh, they basically taste like roast beef. Uh, pigs are omnivores. And in some, in some areas, pigs will be more uh, carnivorous than in others. It just depends on what kind of food sources they have available. There are um, a few areas of Argentina, actually, that have um, uh, long established populations of wild pigs that um, actually run down sheep and, and hunt them in packs and, and kill the sheep and eat them. Uh, it's <laughs> they're smart animals, they are able to adapt. Um, I've eaten quite a lot of, um, of black bear. I had a bear um, that um, somebody had hit by a car, hit with a car, and I had to finish it off. And uh, there was all that meat, and I'd always been very deeply skeptical of eating uh, bear. And of course, bears, again, that's another animal that's an omnivore. Um, you really wouldn't know the difference between bear and beef if I put it in front of you. I mean, I, and I did do this to people. I did taste test with bear burgers. Um, and I wrote a piece for Slate about this, actually. And um, nobody could tell the difference, really. So, um, yeah, I, I would not hesitate to eat anything just because it was a carnivore. Yes. Yes. Uh, 
speaking of furry, cuddly, cute, um, invasive things, talk about eating um, feral cats. Um, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> that was, that, you know, there was another species that I thought about including in eating aliens. So when, I, when I put together my wish list of, of species I wanted to go after in there, I didn't want to include anything that would tend to discredit the whole concept. For example, we've all had our houses invaded by stink bugs for the last few years, and it is, you know, I'm assured by, by entomologists that it is possible to eat them, and they don't taste like they smell, and that they can be... Uh, okay, uh, sure, but I'm, you know, if I do that, then it's just, instead of, you know, being, having a book that's taken serious, like, look, the guy that eats bugs, you know? <laughs> and nobody, nobody, I mean, people might want to, like, sort of point and, like, you know, gawk at it, but it would undermine the whole premise of me saying, you know, this is a serious thing. And it's the same thing with cats. I like cats. I don't want to kill a cat. I don't want to eat one. Uh, I do agree that, um, that, that, Cats are an incredibly destructive um, uh, thing to put out in the wild here. There's no species like that that's native to North America. I think, um, I, think uh, I believe that, that most um, um, domestic cats are descended from the Spanish wildcat, which is from the you know, Eurasian continents. They don't belong here. They do kill, he, whether it's hundreds of millions or, or billions, I've heard different figures of, it, of, uh, of songbirds every year. They are very destructive. I don't think you need to kill feral cats um, actually to fix the problem. But there may be a few acute situations where you have like a, a population of like, nesting birds that are critically endangered and you have to protect that place. But I've noticed that um, feral cat populations tend to depend on um, human assistance and sometimes recruitment from more recruitment from, from um, well, new domestic cats joining them. And when you find an ongoing feral cat problem somewhere, usually the people who are feeding them or they've got garbage to go through. I can't think of any, I've hunted and camped and hiked in some very wild places in the US. I can't think of any really remote place where I ever saw feral cats away from people. Uh, so I think if we spay and neuter and stop having outside cats, I think we could. De I think that problem would go away in 10 years. They just don't seem to be able to establish self-sufficient hunting colonies without human support very often. So I think we don't need to shoot lots and lots of field cats to fix that problem. More questions? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I have two. Uh, one for you and one for you. Um, the first one is. I guess, I know uh, Tonos produces tofu, right? Right. And I was wondering what your feelings were on this just blasting of tofu. <laughs> and, you know, um, so that's my first question. Um, and I guess I'll just wait until you finish and I'll ask my second question. <laughs> um, we do produce tofu. Uh, it's organic. Um, I'm sure those, those beans, I, they, I know where they come from. They're bioregional. They don't come from out west. They come from... Uh, Virginia or North Carolina, Carolinas, so, but they are trucked in uh, in order to produce the sort of quantity of tofu that we produce. We do need large amounts of soybeans. We're not going to grow them all ourselves. It's way right. too much. And I'm sure it's true. I mean, I have seen uh, tractors going around fields and I've seen small animals <coughs> die as a result or get injured, which is even worse. Um, I'm sure that happens in the production of our tofu. I mean, I do, uh, I make it a requirement for people that want to work in our garden that they have to be willing to squash bucks. I don't, I don't make them squash bigger things, but bugs. Um, because there is, there's no eating that uh, doesn't involve some killing. It's just like you said, except maybe a few Jane monks, and we don't have any of those at Twin Oaks. Um, some death is, is, is almost inevitable, and uh, I know that some is involved in making tofu. I'm not a big tofu eater myself, so I don't feel I need to defend it enormously. Um, but, yeah, but I, it's, it's, yeah, it's part of eating. It's just, everything is connected, yeah. yeah. Second question? Yeah, my second question uh, was going back to the uh, climate change and race of species sort of debate. Um, I think, I don't know how many people realize that as it changes, the species distributions are supposed to change, and they have to change. And my, my internal debate with invasive species has been <clears throat> if they're better at living in the new climate, should we be trying to get rid of them? Or should we just move as many species as we can to wherever they can live? Mm -hmm. Um, so we don't collapse the entire biosphere. 
<laughs> like, are, are we being counterproductive when we, when we go after invasives? Um, the question, I guess what it comes down to is, um, do extinctions matter? Because when you have, you, you, I mean, it, it's a kind of a rule of thumb in ecology that you cannot have uh, two species occupying the same niche in the same place at, you know, at the same time. I mean, they, they're, they're basically going to be, whether it's a hot war or a cold war, they will be at war with each other, and within, it's only a matter of time until, you know, one succeeds and the other fails. Um, and there are other ways that invasive species can cause extinctions. So the question is, do we care about extinction? You know, um, and, and are you prepared? And if not, if you're saying, well, we'll just let them let them do what they're doing, are you prepared to carry that same you know consistency to other um, uh, you know, other conservation issues? Um, uh, you know, would, would you um, do we get? Should we just get rid of the Endangered Species Act? Should we get rid of Endangered Species Protection? Uh, do we stop? Should we say, hey, you know what? If the bald eagles can't hack it, you know, why are we going to protect their nesting? <laughs> you know, they could go nest somewhere else. Right. Where, I mean, if you take that logic and extend it elsewhere, I don't really think that meshes with anyone's values. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, this is a man-made problem. This isn't just nature when, when these these species move around. This isn't just you know nature going about things by themselves. This is human activity moving these things from one place to another. So I think it's sort of akin to, you know, if you're going to say, well, you got an invasive species dumped in a lake, and do we just let it go? Well, I don't really see much difference between that and saying, I'm going to take this truckload of uh, uh, mercury and, and raw sewage, and I'm going to dump it into this lake. Um, and in both cases, you're killing wildlife and changing the, the habitat. I don't really see a big difference between jumping the mercury in and dumping the invasive species. And it's in both cases, it's human activity that is changing this ecosystem and extirpating or potentially causing the extinction of native wildlife. And it's human activity that's doing it. And I believe that human beings collectively have a responsibility to clean our mercury out of the water and to clean invasive species out of the same water. I have a question for, for both of you, which is, while you were writing your book and doing your research, was there one thing that, that jumped out of you, or jumped out at you, and made you say, why aren't more people eating this? Whether it was uh, a crop that was easier to grow than everybody thinks around here, or uh, something that freaks people out and tastes better than you would think. So, from your two perspectives, what, what should we be eating if we're not? Um. There, there are several vegetables that I've been surprised that people don't eat more of, but I, I wouldn't say it's because they freak people out exactly. Well, that's Let's, more yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <I'm scared. laughs> no, there aren't any scary vegetables. They're just not scary. Um, I, I found uh, like parsnips, leeks, celeriac. They're sort of relatively unknown vegetables, and yet they'll grow perfectly well and they're, in my opinion, they're delicious. Uh, so I do wonder, you know, why don't, why don't people in Virginia <coughs> want to eat parsnips? You know, there are things that I've, I've grown at, or we in the garden crew have grown at Twin Oaks and then we take them to the kitchen and the cooks just weren't interested in them or people didn't want to eat them. Like, we've given up growing all the sort of bitter and really hot. Like, we don't grow mustard greens, even though they're sort of regional. Um, people at Twin Oaks just don't seem to like mustard greens. Maybe they're a bit scary. They're quite strong flavored, <laughs> but they're, they're not real scary. So there are some things like that that I'm just left wondering, why don't people want to eat these, you know? Um, so I'm hoping that, yeah, that my book will help more people try out more of these different vegetables. Like leeks, like people, a lot of people don't, I guess recipes and experience are lacking. Like we grow lots and lots of leeks, and at first the cooks, they all knew how to make leek and potato soup, and that was the extent of, of what they could do with leeks. And, and I'm busy explaining, oh, there's, there's many more things you can do with leeks, you don't have to combine them with potatoes. And you can wait till the winter to eat leeks, you don't have to have them in August. So there's a lot of, that can be done with more uh, education and more information and people being a bit willing to experiment. Um, yeah. Now, I'll just scare us. <laughs> um, 
Well, one of these is kind of scary, actually. Uh, the two, there are two fish that come to mind, uh, lionfish and silver carp, both of which you know, I'm sure everyone here has, whether you recall the name or not, you've certainly read about this stuff in the news. Uh, lionfish, of course, are the, uh, do I have a picture of them? No. Uh, lionfish are the, um, uh, the, the fish known for their uh, scary, venomous spines. It's, uh, there are several species of lionfish that are invasive here. They're, they're native to the Pacific and Indian Oceans. And long story short, it's through uh, aquariums where they were used uh, for decorative purposes. Um, they ended up in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, they're in the Caribbean. They're now in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, we will have them all the way up the East Coast, probably all the way up to Massachusetts, actually, within you know, 10 to 20 years. Um, they are established populations as far north as, uh, as North Carolina. And the point is, it's this, it's this uh, fish that looks so scary. I mean, it's well named. It looks like a, it's almost like a lion. It's got these this big showy display of um, sharp, venomous spines off of both sides and off of, uh, off of it, its top fins. And um, it's been misrepresented as poisonous, and that's actually not true, it's venomous. The difference between, you know, if you talk about the animal being poisonous, being the, the throughout the meat you would have something that's toxic uh, to a human, whereas venom is isolated, like a, you know, a venomous snake is, you know, the venom is just in this, uh, it's just up in the head and, the, and it comes out through the fangs. Um, and it's like that with a lionfish. And um, if you do step on one, if you do get poked one, it is, you know, a very unpleasant uh, experience. Some people describe it as like a, like a bee sting, and other people have horrible reactions where it's months until they have full use of the limb again, and in a few cases people have died. And, and um, the, the, the thing is that it's delicious, though. I mean, I've, I, I went to Eleuthera in the Bahamas um, to spearfish for these with a, uh, this guy named Mojo White. He was a very, he's a surfer and very committed. Um, he's an American expat. He's really, really committed to, to fighting lionfish. And I went all the way there just so that I could work with this guy, Mojo. And, um, you know, we got a bunch of lionfish. They're very easy to see. You have to use a spear because they, because of the, the habitat they prefer. It's on reefs where if you try to get a hook in line, they're just going to get tangled up on the reef. And um, it, the texture was like Chilean sea bass. It had this bright, clean flavor. It was such a, it was such a wonderful surprise. I mean, I'm not really, most fish kind of taste the same to me, um, but the texture was so much like Chilean sea bass. I've had it when it's been frozen to ship and it's not quite as good. It doesn't have that quite as bright a flavor, for, for lack of a better term. It was such a great surprise. And, you know, the, the thing about those venomous spikes is that, um, little known fact, the venom is almost chemically almost the exact same thing as what uh, catfish have. And, you know, you see catfish on the different, I think Swai is one of the new names they have for it. Catfish you'll find sold. Uh, in any grocery store at this point, and nobody's afraid to work. But people all say, oh, I'm, I'd be too afraid to cook with lionfish. Uh, catfish have, they don't have as many of the spines, but they have one on each side and one on the top. That's why any experienced fisherman here know you're supposed to handle catfish really carefully when you catch them. It's the same venom. You know, it's the same issue where it's, it's temperature sensitive, where if you get stung by a catfish or a lionfish, you just kind of warm that uh, part of your body up and the, and the, the venom becomes harmless. And you can do that with exhaust from a boat engine or from a tea kettle or, or whatever. Uh, so it's not something that people have to be as scared of as they think they do. Uh, and the other big surprise that I think people should be eating is silver carp. There's a myth among American fishermen that carp are inedible. There's a story that, 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 that you see different fish plugged into this, but there's this sort of thing that gets passed around like, by fishermen, and they say, you know, the best recipe for um, for, for silver for carp for any carp, they say, well, you want to cook a carp. What, what you do is you take uh, you take a carp, and then you take a bunch of uh, oh, you want a whole bunch of uh, oregano and and in uh, other seasons, it's going to be salt and pepper and some olive oil and a little bit of lime juice. And you put it on a piece of cardboard, and you're going to soak it with all that, and, and really let it let it let it get. And you're going to put it in the oven at about 300 degrees, you know, for um, for, for 35 minutes. And you can take it out, and then you um, you throw the fish away and eat the cardboard. <laughs> And, and this gets passed around as one of these like truthy things. But American fishermen say, "Well, you just can't eat carp." And people, I mean, they tell the joke and you kind of laugh. But you know, every time I've had a fisherman say that to me, I said, "Well, have you ever actually eaten the carp?" He's, "Oh, no, I wouldn't eat that." Well, I have eaten. It's just it's like cod. It's real. The texture and the taste is like cod. In a blind taste test, I guarantee you would not know the difference between uh, between carp and cod. The bone structure is different, so you can't fillet it the same way you would most other fish. You have these floating bones. So you have to learn how to cut up a fish all over again. But man, we could clean rivers out. You could be putting this stuff in, um, you know, in fish sticks and, and fillets, you know, stuff on grocery store shelves. 
And, and that's a fish that literally jumps into the boat on its own. I mean, I hate all the hand ribbing. How are we going to get rid of the silver carp? This fish, you know, at the sound, the approach of a motor, they all jump into the air. I filled a live well up in about, I don't know, between 15 and 30 minutes you know, with fish this big um, just by jumping into the boat. You know, I don't understand why we're so, well, we need to spend $100 million on a program with, like, electronic barriers and all this stuff. It's just, it's Stone Age technology. We'll, we'll get rid of this fish, you know, just a couple people in a net, and if you have an engine also, so much the better. But, so those are my two fish, that I, my two species I'll put forth, that lionfish and silver carp. Um, first you, and then back to you. Okay. How's your other vegetable question? About uh, things like uh, turnips, beets, and radishes. When I was a kid, you buy them in the, in the store, and they already had all the greens hacked off of them. But it turns out that the greens are very delicious and very nutritious. So is that a separate prop for you, you know, for market farming, or uh, what, just, how do you deal with those? Uh, are the tops of root vegetables a separate prop? Um, uh, they're a crop. We do. We, we use them. Um, and I do mention them in my book. Um, beet greens. You that you can use them just as you would use spinach. Uh, they taste somewhat similar. Uh, sometimes, uh, if we have a lot of spinach, we can't get people to eat the beet greens because sure. it's just too much of a good thing. Um, turnip greens uh, can be very good. Uh, we found particularly. Um, like they need to be grown fast and to be in good condition to be nice. Um, we find what works best is uh, the little turnips that we grow in the hoop house in the winter. Um, there's, there's various different, um, they're very, uh, you usually harvest them small, the turnips. And because the vegetables are growing inside the hoop house, the greens stay in primo condition. They're not all battered by the weather. And so the, you'd be silly not to eat them. They just, you can see by looking that they're really delicious. Um, also for smooth, you can use them in smoothies, the green, those kind of greens too. Ah, ah, I'm conflicted because uh, I have, I've made a rule that people can't juice our vegetables because it mostly it's very wasteful. And so... Well, I'm not juicing, juicing with the juice, smoothie, you grind them up. You grind it all up and so you don't lose anything. No. Right, right. I was having trouble with the juicing plant. carrots. But yeah, you eat the whole plant. Yeah, that'd be good. Uh, don't do it in Hawaii. Uh, I had some friends just come back from Hawaii and they talked to someone who, there's this thing called a rat lung nematode or something, it, and it, it gets in slugs and it's on greens, and this person made a green smoothie with this, it must have had like a whole slug, and this person was in a coma for months. But we don't have those in Virginia, so, uh, <laughs> yet. Uh, yeah, smoothies. If we do, I won't eat them. No. Bad <laughs> Nobody needs them. Um, what, was the, what was the third vegetable? Rutabagas? No, uh, radishes. Radishes. The, the turnips and... Uh, yeah. Um, with radishes, uh, we only use the leaves when they're small. Uh, well, it depends what variety of radishes you grow. But some of them, as the radishes grow bigger, the leaves are quite so hairy, prickly, some turnips are this way as well. You wouldn't want to eat the leaves raw after they get beyond a certain size. But we do, um, we use, when we're thinning little vegetables, we often put whatever it is in a salad mix. We just snip the root part off. So radish leaves, yeah. Um, yeah, any of those small, small leaves. In fact, if we're, um, oh, we're running out of time. Um, if we're short of uh, salad mix, We'll, uh, we'll just get some old seeds of greens, any, anything we've got left over, and sow those. And pretty quickly they'll grow up, and then we just come along and cut, cut the whole row down. And uh, There's a few things I learned to leave out. There's one kind of turnip, I've forgotten which it is, unfortunately. It has very hairy leaves at an early stage, so that's not a good one. But in general, any, practically anything you can uh, eat as a salad green. Thank you. There is one question in the back, and hand with a simultaneous, Susan. Mine could be pretty great, but it's for Jack. Um, you told us about scary fish to eat. Yeah. What's our tastiest local alien? Ooh, tastiest local alien. Um, we, you know, we are fortunate not to have the same problems with invasive species right in central Virginia that, they, that you find in most places. Um, depends on how local you mean. It doesn't have to be an invasive. 
what, what is a tasty local species that we might consider eating? Oh, deep, you know, I, I hate to fall, be the dead horse, but like, for bang for your buck, deer. 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 You know, one deer, even a small one, you're looking at at least 40 pounds of food. You know, I mean, the equipment, I mean, you compare that to just what you'd spend at the grocery store if you're going to average between different cuts. Say it's like average seven bucks a pound. Um, you know. What about a ground? Uh, I have, actually, groundhog's one of the one of the few things around here I have not eaten. But I have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think it tastes like chicken? Uh, it tastes like a mix between beef and chicken. <laughs> um, as far as the stuff that really is invasive, um, uh, pigeons. The common pigeon here um, is in, that that is a, a European invader. Um, I have not eaten pigeon from right here in Albany County. Whether you find them in Charlottesville, all over the place. I mean, you can't discharge a firearm in Charlottesville, but there is Charlottesville City Code does specifically uh, have an exemption. It says specifically that um, that starlings and um, uh, pigeons. Uh, may be killed year-round in, in Charleston. As long as you don't use a, a means of take, you know, like a, like a firearm that you can't use in city limits. Um, and I have done this in, in, in actually in Central Park uh, last fall. I hunted pigeons um, with a um, city pigeon. This is, oddly enough, this is for Prevention Magazine. They wanted to do something with me, which is, I don't know what they thought was going to happen. This would be sort of like if... <laughs> You know, Tiger Beat decided to spend a day with Hunter S. Thompson. I don't know what, what they thought was going to happen, but we ended up uh, running down, as a friend and I, we were, were running down pigeons on foot, hunting by hand. Uh, first we were trying to grab them, and they, they were onto us. They, they knew we were up to something. Uh, and then we tried, we, we, we were throwing, uh, beating them with apples and rocks and stunning them and running in. And he would throw the rock, because he was better aim, and I would run in and finish it off with a knife. So we're hunting pigeons. Uh, with knives and, and with our bare hands in, in, um, Central, Park. in, in, in Central Park. And, um, you know, New Yorkers are so jaded, usually. <laughs> yeah, like on my way over to this thing with Prevention Magazine, I got on the subway, and I'm sitting in the subway car, and, you know, there's the doors between the two cars you're not supposed to, no one's supposed to go through. Like, those doors open up, and a mariachi band walks in. They've got, like, a big stand-up bass and a guitar and a bajo sex <laughs> coat. And there's this mariachi band as they launch into a song right there. Nobody even looks up. Because New Yorkers are too cool. Are you not going to acknowledge the fact that there is a mariachi band that's just launched into song two feet away from you? And then the, they got off for the next stop. And so with that in mind, it really takes a lot to, to shock New Yorkers. Um, but we were in, uh, in Central Park. We were right just uh, actually by the Upper West Side. Where, and, and unfortunately, the, the pigeons, it turns out, like to be where we tried to hunt them where it would be discreet. And, um, you know, the problem is that the pigeons want to be where people are because that's where the food is. And then the only place we could really consistently get on the pigeons was right by this playground, actually. Uh, <laughs> where all the, the nannies for these, you know, extremely wealthy Upper West Side people were coming. And um, uh, so, yeah, we, we got this pigeon. And I, I, we, we, the trick was to run away before people could really comprehend what had just happened. That I'm decapitating this pigeon and shoving his wings are still flapping and I'm shoving it into the, the backpack and we just ran away. Um, and Prevention Magazine, by the way, they were the lookouts. They were like actually baiting the pigeon. And so they, this was not just journal. I mean, they were in on it, uh, these nice young ladies. Um, but the point is, it, it, was, it tasted fine. Everyone said, oh, city pigeon, you can't eat that. That's going to taste terrible. And I thought, yeah, you're probably right, but someone should actually find out. So I went and I did it, and we cooked it. Actually, we used the same apples that we were throwing. Uh, we, we, like, we diced those up and put a little brown sugar on those and kind of served them with it. It was, it was a, like a kind of feral apple tree in the park. Uh, but it tasted fine, actually. It was like it tasted a lot like dove, which I really, I'm sure most people here haven't eaten. But it's a red meat. It's probably closer to beef than it is to chicken because it's you know they're migratory birds. They do they exercise those muscles a lot. It tasted fine, and everyone was oh everyone was well, what 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 is a city pigeon gonna eat? You know it must be disgusting. Well, I opened up the crop and saw, and it was macaroni and Cheerios. <laughs> So they're basically eating what we're eating, and if that's so disgusting, we have other problems. But, but the point is, yeah, we, if you want an invasive species that tastes fine that we have right here in Charlottesville, yeah, pigeons are all over the place. Uh, apples are cheap, rocks are free. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I'm done. Are we willing to take one last question before we close down and go to the back? Go ahead. It's short. Um, can you buy venison locally? You can buy, sort of, um, the, the vast majority of what's the, the venison sold in the U.S. is actually, 
it's not whitetail. Well, when the species of deer we have that's native here is uh, is the whitetail, and mo the vast majority of the of the, um, the meat that the venison that's sold is actually European red deer or sometimes elk. Most of which is actually some of it is, is U.S. domestic production. Most of it actually comes from New Zealand, oddly enough. Um, it is unlawful to sell wild venison in the U.S. I think that's a good thing. Um, we did we banned market hunting a long time ago because of you know it's a tragedy of the commons. If you, people could shoot all the deer they wanted to, I mean it is a native species. Deer are not an invasive species here. You know we're the you know we're we're um, we're the ones who knocked out their native predators, um, and so they are a nuisance species, but they're not they're not invasive. Um, but to answer your question, yeah, you can buy venison, but it, you're not buying the environmental benefits because it's usually it's probably something that was shipped from New Zealand uh, or it was farmed and probably fed on grain and all that. Um, wild venison in the U.S. you can give it away, you um, you can trade it, but you can't sell it. Thank you very much for joining us. festival book um, and our sponsor Earth Week. Uh, the authors will be at their tables in the back available to sign anything that you want to pick up or have on you. <laughs> <laughs>